Hey, we're back at live in San Francisco at Node Summit. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with Alex Williams, our managing editor of our enterprise uh, online publication. And uh, we're here talking about Node.js, Node Summit. It's a the inaugural conference around Node and the evolution of this phenomenon around I.O. Um, in San Francisco and changing kind of the developer landscape relative to cloud, mobile, a lot of success stories. And our guest is Theo Schlossnagel uh, from Omni IT, runs the Surge Conference. Welcome back to theCUBE. We had you on Strata. I think Dave, inter Dave Vellante interviewed you. Um, Strata is O'Reilly's big data conference, uh, which is coming up in February, which will be there with theCUBE as well this year again. And uh, you know, big data and Node kind of all play hand in hand, but at the end of the day, it's about infrastructure, it's about infrastructure IT, infrastructure as, as a service, service providers all across the board. Um, we were talking yesterday, Theo, around, uh, we haven't seen, we've seen this before, it's just old wine in a new bottle, however you want to look at it. Um, uh, DevOps uh, trend, you were talking and saying, hey, it's not really about DevOps, it's about ops in dev. Um, so, first, what's, What's your take on Node, and and why all the, is it hyped up? Is it real? What's the what's going on here from your perspective? So my take on Node, uh, it's it's, uh, I don't listen to that much hype, um, so I'm not sure if it's overhyped or underhyped. Um, all I know is that we found it pretty valuable. Um, we were able to save a lot of money, uh, reduce timeframes on projects. Um, we we're able to prototype things and actually launch them into production in ways that that we don't have to invest a lot in ongoing maintenance. So, it's real, which I think is important, um, and it's uh, it's it's simplicity, just uh, makes it a, a lot more consumable. So, it's great. Our our engineers, not so much front end, but a lot of our back engineers, back end engineers that write C plus plus and C and Perl. They, they're starting to write JavaScript just because it's it's easy. You've been around the block. You know you know infrastructure. You're what we call a guru in, in our world, and, and you have a lot of experience and in platforms and IT. What, what's your take on on this developer movement? It's it seems to be a new crossover from the front end to back end, and then it's got all the new new capabilities. What's what's new here? What's not new here? Or is it just wine in a new bottle? What's so, I mean, talk about DevOps or yeah, DevOps and, and in general. I think the so, I mean, I, I my bread and butter is building back-end infrastructure systems. So I, I build system software um, from you know down in the the kernel level up to um, back-end database technology and web server technology, um, and there are. Not so many new problems there. Um, they're interesting problems. Uh, there's a lot of history to them. There's a lot of computer science around them. Um, there are problems that front-end developers tend to not be uh, so intimately aware of. So now that we have front-end developers um, flexing their proverbial muscles in back-end code, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ignorance there, um, and that's kind of dangerous. Um, those things can change just through education and, and awareness, but we see people who uh, don't understand the problems they're facing, uh, blindly solving them again, and making all the same mistakes that were made 15, 20 years ago is um, it, in those things. Is this due to issues with concurrency in Node? Uh, largely due to issues with concurrency in, co in, in Node, but there are also things like I.O. safety and system resiliency and robustness and all of those things that, I mean, you're running your JavaScript code in a browser, it's not that you don't care about them, it's that the problems are different and you're just, you're just it's an unfamiliar terrain. So you need more computer science on the back end? Uh, you need to take some courses in systems programming and database programming, not, not programming a database, but building a database. Um, uh, yeah, there's just more computer science aspects. How are you seeing these problems surface right now? Um, systems that are deployed um, that give the illusion of correct operation that basically turn around and screw you in the end. I mean, they, they, they crash, they break, they lose data. Um, there's just not the right um, acumen to the, the values that, that are so key in building back-end systems. Um, so people build stuff that's that breaks. So we were talking yesterday about DevOps and, and, and you were saying when they when the dev gets more ops then we'll talk and dev <laughs> saying no we're ops. I, I thought that was pretty clever and I think that's interesting because you know it's hard to be a systems programmer. I mean you gotta go to school for it, get a degree in operating systems or whatever. It's just not there's not many of them, right? So yeah. what are some of the things that you're seeing relative to those those uh, those stumbling blocks, if you will. So, I mean, I've talked about DevOps and, and a lot, and one of my taglines that I'm known for, I think someone called me Trollo Schlossnagel the, the other day, is, is I like that, that. I, so that I say DevOps is bullshit. And I mean, the reason I say that is actually so that people will pay attention, not so much that the movement is BS, right? It, it's, 
It's that there are a whole bunch of developers who tend to evangelize themselves more than, say, the, the, the blood and the mud systems administrator that's been managing these systems. They get that, I mean, the bastard operator from hell exists for a reason, right? Yeah. They're asked to do one thing, make systems run all the time. And they can never exceed expectations. It's not like they can run more than all the time, right? So um, it's a different culture. So now the engineering groups are saying, we have all these really good practices for managing projects and managing code and managing concepts and, 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 and the evolution of our software. Let's take all those brilliant ideas and help these ops guys who are just hopeless. Yeah. And that attitude, I mean, you can rephrase that in a really endearing way, <laughs> and, that, and that's not the way it's usually phrased. And the yeah. interesting part is the, a lot of ops people are very resistant to that because they see the other side of that coin. It's like, wow, you know what? I'm sure you know what you're doing, but your software breaks all the fucking time in my architecture. So you, your, your, your best practices clearly don't build software that's operational. So how about taking some of our operational mentality and putting it in your software engineering practices. And and the only reason I say DevOps is bullshit is so that I, I make people aware that the pendulum has swung a little too far to one side, yeah. right? And it's both groups that can really benefit from each other. And we had someone on the cube yesterday quoted uh, ops as TNT, they blow things up, it was Oren from Heroku, and TNT stands for the no team. When you go to ops and you say, you know, can we do something? No. Don't take it to the no team. But in a way, the reality is, is that, you know, they have, they are taken for granted. I mean, ops yeah. has to run stuff. And when it breaks, shit happens, right? right. You and lose the, money, apps fail, customers aren't happy. Right. I mean, it's direct impact to the business. So the interesting part is that there are things that will break. There are things that are out of your control. There are physical constraints. There are you know systems constraints. Um, but then someone builds you a piece of software and gives it to you. Why does that get to break too, right? I mean, the software is kind of a pure thing. You, you don't actually have to have broken software. And if it is broken, why can't I ask questions about how it's broken? Why is that software not instrumented to make my job easier? So, and, yeah. and those things are just missing a lot of times. So what are you seeing in, you know, to, to make, what are you seeing out there that, you're, that, that would cause this balance, cause us to be more balanced? Do you see uh, any, uh, any, any this, signs of this balance changing at all? I, I, this conversation. This um, conversation. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I talk at conferences a lot about um, about DevOps, um, and I, I, I it's not that I don't believe in the angle that's usually presented. It's I'm presenting the other angle to make sure that it gets fair balance. I mean, I think pulling software engineering practices into ops is a great thing. Systems automation, all this stuff is awesome, um, but you can't lose sight of the fact that there are software engineers that really don't understand what having an operational zero downtime, no error mentality is, is really about. So. Well, we, we're proud to launch DevOps Angle today. We just launched it on siliconangle.com. It's a section soon to be propagating from a URL to a URL, devopsangle.com. And, and it's important. A lot of people are talking about it because IT is a cost in, in a way, operationally, is a lot of cost involved. I mean, you know, the old joke, 70% is to run the business and, you know, 30% to actually do any innovation. So people are trying to get the operational roles kind of trimmed down and efficient. So, you know, it's a challenge. I, and I think it's cultural. I mean, we used to call it network and software guys. It was that simple. If you were a network guy and a software right. guy, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, screw you, you know, kind of thing. It's got a war, cold war going on. Yep. Um, you know, so I think culturally, it has to come down from the top executives. Uh, and, and does that, as a CIO, I mean, in your experience, how do you go with these engagements with your with customers and, and what are their, what, what's it like? I mean, do you walk in, the CIO says, okay, Theo, you guys got to just run the show or change these guys. I mean, what happens? Take us through the, that process. And do you think it's top down? It is, it, I mean, it's, it comes from both sides. It really depends on the engagement. Our engagements vary. Um, so we do a lot of strategic services um, where we're doing consulting. Some of it's from the bottom up where you have um, people on the, on the lower level, director of operations and down that, that, that can't meet their service level agreements and feel like they're put in a position where they can't succeed. And their feedback to upper management of, you know, I need more transparency across the organization. I need to be able to, you know, I'm enabling marketing. I don't get to see their KPIs. Right? Like, how am I supposed to enable them if I don't know if I'm actually enabling them? Um, and they're not being listened to, so we're pulled in to actually have that voice in a, in, a, in a better way. And then sometimes we're pulled in by a CIO or a CTO, sometimes CEO, to actually, you know, exert that sort of pressure and that sort of accountability across the organizations going down. So We're here inside the queue with uh, Theo Sloshnagel, who's with Omni IT, systems programmer, guru, runs the conference, um, Surge. Um, 
what's next in this evolution in your mind? Okay, you know, try to shoot the arrow forward a little bit. You know, nodes here today, all those challenges that you mentioned are legit, real. What's going to happen? What do you see the forecast? Of Maybe the in, in, perhaps in context of the types of discussions you expect to unfold at Surge this year. So. Surge is a systems engineering conference, um, so we're really talking about um, building enormous systems uh, and, and doing it wrong. And, and one of the things that I've learned over my career is that um, I can learn so much more from someone's failure than from their success. So really what I want is I want companies to come in and, and talk about how they had this grand idea, they did this research, they did this implementation, and they still have the scars. Right? It didn't work. It, it, there were bad assumptions. There were, there were bad ideas. And to walk us through those steps, and if you, te if you do that and you have some good storytelling, you, you can walk away with that. So the conversations are really about failure in a lot of ways, um, and then uh, learning from those, those mistakes. And hopefully you can you know, get enough out of that conversation to, to not make the same mistakes. And the future for this community, what do you see this? Do you see it kind of meeting up to expect expectations? Uh, I, I don't know what the expectations of the Node community are. Um, the Node community is incredibly young, um, yes. and uh, the, the product is incredibly young, um, but the potential that we've seen hands-on with it um, definitely tells us that there's a long life to it. Um, so I, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see the Node community growing up. Um, not as an, an insult that they're all immature, it's just that they, so there's a lot of growing up to do in this community and, 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 and feeling like, you know, where do we belong um, in, in sort of a service platform, delivery platform context? Uh, are we, are, do, do we power embedded devices? Do we power, you know, uh, control planes on networking equipment? Do we power API endpoints on the web? Um, there's a lot of talk here about uh, enabling mobile technology due to the, the architecture of Node. It really fits well with that. Um, we've seen that. We've used it for that. And uh, it's an exciting technology to be using in that space. Joint, joint would say everything's a Node. So yeah, why couldn't it encompass everything? I'm more pragmatic than that. Um, <laughs> uh, node is a way to tell a computer what to do. Um, yeah, yeah. All I want is a computer to do it. So Node is a means to an end. Um, there are other technologies that work really well, too. So this young community, there's a lot of young people who are who've learned JavaScript, mm -hmm. um, and, and PHP to some extent, I mean, that's a little, skews a little bit older. Is that becoming an, a reason why more companies are adopting Node.js? Because you, there are a lot of people who know JavaScript, there are a lot of people who know PHP. Um, I think there, there are a couple of different reasons. When you say PHP is older, God, you make me feel ancient. Um, so PHP wasn't around when I started. Um, so. <laughs> I, I was thinking like mid-20s <laughs> to late-20s. Uh, I'll try to remember what it feels like to be that <laughs> way. Uh. Elementary uh. school, the teenager. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, the, the adoption of Node.js, I mean, I think that the the scalability aspects, the fact that I can write a prototype for an application and actually have that scale to a, a reasonable level. I mean, it's not going to be the most high performance code in the world. It's not going to scale to infinity. Um, but I can get so much further than I used to be able right. to get in, in, a, in a scripting language like, like Python or Perl or PHP. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other, which I hear talked about a lot, um, that I only see a couple of companies actually embracing is the fact that I'm writing JavaScript code for the front end and for the back end and those things that are in common I don't have to write twice. Right. So I don't have cross-implementation bugs um, that, that happen when you re-implement something in a separate language. Um, oh, I actually haven't personally experienced that utopia. Um, <laughs> we don't tend to run the same code on the back end and the front end. They, they, they tend to be somewhat separate um, because of the way our APIs run and, and almost every client we, we interface with. So. Mm -hmm. I, those are the two reasons I hear, though. What have you seen here at Node Summit that um, caught you by surprise or surprised you in a way, in good and bad, around the content and the startups or anything here? Um, the people that I thought were running Node are not running it so much, and there are a lot of people running it that I had no idea were running it. So it's kind of a, in a, in a way, there are a lot of people that don't talk about their uses of products, and you have to catch them in the hallway track and engage them offline in a way where they'll open up about that. So I learned a whole bunch of really interesting uses of Node.js that weren't in the public eye and still aren't. Like what, what? Like what example? Um, so the, um, the, the infrastructure components, um, the Rackspace guys are, are running Node.js for, for deployment platforms. Um, the, uh, the, the Walgreens stuff was actually really interesting. I thought the Walgreens um, interesting. guys talked about their use of Node on, on both sides of the, the platform is, I mean, they're doing really interesting. 
I care about things that, 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 that make money or save it. I mean, those are the things that I, I really care about as a CEO. Um, so when we were able to implement some of our backend systems from C and C++ into Java, uh, JavaScript and, and Node.js, I, I mean, I have all of the, the, the numbers that say how beneficial that was to us financially and to have another company come in completely abstract that I've never talked to and actually have a very resembling opinion uh, and perspective on that was was both validating and, and, and speaks well for making that decision again. All right, we hear saving money and making money. That's the focus of a business. Uh, Node seems to be hot. Theo, Slash Nagel, thanks for coming inside the cube again. Great to see you. Thanks a lot. Uh, great knowledge. Omni IT, great firm. Omni TI. Omni TI, sorry. It's all right, sorry. everybody <laughs> messed it up. <laughs>